Hello, Emeas Eagles. Psalm 118, verse 24 says, Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I hope you're having a great Friday thus far. Today, we are privileged to have with us our second guest speaker for, for Friday chapels, Pastor Gary Kirst from Galena Bible Church. Pastor Gary has been the pastor there for the last 30 years, um, and we are privileged to have him with us today. He is also a graduate of Trinity Evangelical School of Divinity, uh, where he received his Master's of Divinity degree, Divinity degree and also his Doctor of Ministry most recently. Gary will be helping us launch a new Friday Chapel series we're calling A New Normal. This new series is meant to remind us that God is with us even in the disorienting, culture-shifting situations we find ourselves in. Whether because of a global pandemic like COVID-19, a new life stage by choice, or a sudden change by chance, we look to, we look to Scripture for guidance. Before Gary comes, we will have a song for reflection from Miss Elisa Cooper, another one of her original songs, then a scripture reading, and then Gary. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is going to be from Acts 28, 17 through 31. Again, that's Acts 28, 17 through 31. After three days, he called together all the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, 
For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers, uh, through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be with you. It's always a, a great honor and privilege to open up God's Word uh, with you for an Emmaus Chapel. I wish we could be together in person, maybe, hopefully, soon. Uh, but, we, you know, we go with the flow here. Well, we have had the joy at our church of working through the book of Acts over this past year. And uh, we come to the end of this series this week with the text that we'll be looking at uh, for chapel today, which was just read for you. Uh, we call this series, Thy Kingdom Come. That's what Jesus taught us to pray, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Father's kingdom is the kingdom of his Son. And so we distilled the overarching theme to the whole book of Acts, what we call the melodic line, to be the risen Lord establishes his reign among his people through his spirit and word to the ends of the earth. And as we come to the end of Acts, that's exactly what we see. According to Jesus' promise in chapter 1, verse 8, his kingdom extending to the ends of the earth. Paul, God's apostle, finally arriving in the imperial city, Rome, to testify to Jesus. From the perspective of Jerusalem, where it all started, Rome was the end of the earth. So there, before the most powerful king on the planet at this time, the Roman emperor Nero, Paul, in chains, as a prisoner awaiting trial, would proclaim the king of kings. That's where the whole narrative of Acts was headed. But is that the end? Now that the kingdom of God had come, represented in local churches that had spread all over the Roman Empire, was that the end? Of course not. It was just the beginning. This kingdom of God was to be proclaimed to everyone on the face of the planet, every tribe, people, and language, and nation, until all would hear. And one day Jesus, who had ascended to his throne in heaven, as recorded at the beginning of Acts, from which he's been orchestrating all this, would get up from that invisible heavenly throne and return to a throne here on this earth to visibly rule in peace and love and righteousness forever. As we pray, thy kingdom come, we're praying, yes, for it's coming in the here and now as people's hearts come under the rule of Jesus through repentance and faith. And we're also praying for that ultimate manifestation of his kingdom when Jesus returns. We pray that final prayer in the Bible, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But now, we're living in Acts chapter 29, we might say. And from what we read, what we read in these final paragraphs, as our author Luke signs off, we ask, what should our lives be like living in Acts 29? First, and we think of the example of the Apostle Paul here, we would say our lives should be above reproach. Those who would set themselves against us because we are followers of Jesus should have no legitimate reason to point their fingers at us in judgment. So Paul continues to make his defense before others who would accuse him of wrongdoing. 
He's already testified before two Roman governors and one Rome-appointed king over the Jews. And now, as he's finally made it to Rome, he's anticipating testifying before the emperor himself. So let's read once more from Acts 28 and verse 17. After three days, after that long and hard journey to Rome, he only needed three days to rest before getting back to his kingdom business. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews there in Rome, uh, Paul maintaining his pattern of always going to the, his fellow Jews first before engaging the Gentiles. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because of the Jews, uh, certain Jews, because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken anything evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Paul's saying to his fellow Jews that he has been falsely accused, that he's innocent of any wrongdoing against his own people. He's been slandered as one who preaches against the law of Moses and against the temple there in Jerusalem. But it's not true. It's fake news. In fact, all he and the Christian church has been doing is proclaiming the hope of Israel. And what is the hope of Israel? We'll see in the next verse in just a minute that it's the promised Messiah, God's King, and his name is Jesus. Jesus, who died for the forgiveness of sins and rose again on the third day, proclaiming this hope was Paul's only crime. And likewise, my brothers and sisters, if anyone is going to point a finger at us for some wrongdoing, may that be our only crime, living consistently with our confession of faith in Jesus. A very appropriate supporting passage in these regards, especially in our present age of rage, is from 1 first, uh, first Peter, Peter's first letter. Keep your finger in the text in Acts 28, but then also turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Peter, likewise, here, is calling believers to live lives above reproach. We humble ourselves under his inspired commands. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. 
When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That was Paul here as he arrived in Rome and tried to establish rapport with the Jewish leaders there, establishing his innocence. He did live above reproach. Our calling too, as we live to advance the kingdom. And of course, the foundation of how we live is the word of God. Paul and these Jewish leaders set up a day when they can hear what Paul and this sect he's a part of, these Christians, this movement that is being spoken against everywhere, uh, is all about. So we read verse 23. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. You see, Paul, now as a follower of Jesus, wasn't making up anything new that wasn't consistent with what God's inspired word, what we call the Old Testament, had it already taught and anticipated. This kingdom of God, this reign of God, this reign of Yahweh, now through his risen son Jesus, is what Moses wrote of in all the prophets. Paul's teaching here in Rome probably sounded a lot like his teaching to the Jews in the synagogue in Antioch, as recorded back in chapter 13. Like quoting from the Psalms, showing how the coming Messiah would actually be God's unique son <clears throat> and would rise from the dead, his flesh not seeing corruption. Certainly Paul would have turned with these leaders to the scroll of Isaiah, where Isaiah writes about God's suffering servant who would bear the sins of God's rebellious people. That servant has come. He's Jesus. Paul surely pointed to Moses' writing about the great prophet to come in Deuteronomy 18, this prophet who would speak with ultimate authority. Everything Paul would proclaim about the kingdom was anchored in the timeless word of God. And again, that's our foundation too. It's so amazing how this book is as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago, even 3,000 years ago, as you think of the Old Testament. It's living and active. It pierces our hearts like nothing else. It comforts our hearts like nothing else. The living God speaks through his word. The kingdom advances as the word advances. Some interesting statements as we go along through Acts, like chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Or 12, 24. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And that's what Emmaus is all about educating and equipping learners to impact the world for Christ. Educating and equipping in what? In God's word. So soak it up, brothers and sisters. Realize what a privilege it is to, for, for you to be studying where you are. That's life in Acts chapter 29, being anchored in God's timeless word and letting the word do its work both in our own hearts and in those to whom we reach out. And so Christ's kingdom advances. But of course, we know such kingdom work won't always be smooth sailing. Like Paul here in our passage, thirdly, we can expect mixed results to our message. Let's read again from verse 24. And some were convinced by what he said. Great! But others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. 
For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. In trying to persuade these Jewish leaders, Paul sees himself in the same role as the prophet Isaiah back when he prophesied to the idol-loving people of Judah back in his day. Not an easy role. Isaiah was given this magnificent vision of God there in the temple as Isaiah is called to his ministry in Isaiah chapter 6. And after God cleanses him from his sin as the, the hot coal is applied to his lips, God asks, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Us, hinting at the Trinity. And Isaiah replies, here I am, Lord, send me. But then Isaiah finds out what he had just signed up for. And God tells him, you'll preach, but no one will listen. In fact, you'll just make their hearts harder against me. You'll be sealing their doom. Definitely not a church growth technique that would become the latest trend and sell millions of copies. So for those Jewish leaders Paul spoke to in Rome, that would be the lot of some of them. Many would have eyes, but not see, and ears, but not hear. And Paul's preaching would just seal the case against them, show them and the world just how right they were for God's judgment as they rejected God's Messiah. But yet, we read, others were convinced and believed. We think back to what Luke records near the beginning of his first volume, the Gospel of Luke, and the old faithful man Simeon, who sees Jesus and uh, Joseph and Mary bringing the baby Jesus into the temple, and it's revealed to him that this is God's Messiah. And, and Simeon takes the baby Jesus in his arms and he praises God and then prophetically says to Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. There will be mixed results, at least from our human perspective. Some will rise, i.e. become right with God through faith in Jesus. And others will will fall, i.e. seal their condemnation from God through their rejection of him. But Simeon also spoke of this baby Jesus being a light for revelation to the Gentiles. He would fling the doors of salvation wide open now to all people, not just God's chosen people, the Jews. And so Paul here, actually for the fourth time in the book of Acts, proclaims that with the Jews' rejection, he's now turning to the Gentiles because they will listen. People like the Ethiopian eunuch, like the Roman centurion, like the Philippian jailer. And brothers and sisters, as the Lord uses us to get his word out there to friends, to co-workers, to extended family members, we too can expect mixed results. Some will get upset when we bring up spiritual things and mention the name of Jesus. There might be outright antagonism for whatever reason. Many might not be antagonistic, but just indifferent. You might as well uh, talk about Alexander the Great or Herbert Hoover. Jesus just being another historical figure that they're not particularly interested in. And they'll quickly change the subject to something more interesting to them, like the latest headlines in the news. But others, others whom the Holy Spirit will have prepared, will know that God is speaking to them through us, that this is a divine appointment, and they won't be able to help but listen. And so we come to a final aspect of what life should be like living in Acts 29. And that is God's call for us to boldly take advantage of our freedom to proclaim his kingdom. Our concluding verses 30. He lived there two whole years at his own expense, surely from gifts of supporting churches, 
and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now, we read this, and there's a sense that we say, hmm, kind of an, uh, an odd ending here. It, it feels unfinished. So Paul's there waiting for his accusers to show up. Apparently they never make it. So the book leaves us with Paul, its primary character, basically in a holding pattern. Now, most conservative scholars believe that Paul was eventually released. And after he was released, he wrote what we call the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. These epistles fit nowhere else in the narrative of Acts, so we assume they were written later. And in 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter, he's about to face the executioner for his death, for his faith. Uh, there's nothing like this free and open ministry that's described here in these last two verses. So, the most likely scenario is that Paul was released from Rome, Roman prison here, and went on to have a few more years of itinerant ministry, quite possibly even making it all the way to Spain, that he said in his letter to the Romans was his goal. And then, as Nero got crazier and cracked down more ruthlessly on the Christians, Paul got re-imprisoned in Rome where he was executed. But here, at this point, a holding pattern, open-ended, and that, obviously, as we believe the Spirit inspired every single word of the Bible, is what God intended. The reader is now invited to join in with Paul and those believers working with him in Rome in their free and bold proclamation of Christ's kingdom. And we do know that even though Paul was under house arrest with a soldier attached to him 24-7, that he had a fruitful ministry. He wrote his letter to the Philippians during this time, and there he writes in Philippians 1, 12, and 13, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Paul was the captive, but every man who guarded him became Paul's captive audience. And so he'll say, as he signs off at the end of Philippians, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Whoa. Even some of the big shots there in Rome apparently became believers. And can't you just imagine the guards who came to faith jockeying over who could guard Paul the most? God's sovereign grace in this whole situation is just marvelous. And again, we are invited to join in. If Paul can freely and boldly proclaim Jesus, even under these conditions, surely so can the church who will have read these words for the next 2,000 years. We're encouraged that nothing can stop God's word from doing its work. Not the power of Rome, not the rejection and opposition of Jewish leaders. Same with us today, here, in our personal lives, in the life of our local churches. We just need the boldness to take advantage of the freedoms God has given us. And at the same time, just like with Paul and with the whole trajectory of the book of Acts, we're concerned with the whole world hearing about Jesus, especially those who up to this point have not even had the chance to hear what we call unreached people groups. Local evangelism and worldwide missions go hand in hand fueled by the same passion to see Jesus' name lifted high and exalted in the hearts of folks who, like us, once lived in the darkness of ignorance and sin, but now, by God's grace, have been brought into his marvelous light. It's interesting, the ends of the earth really is a moving target. Some lands where the gospel thrived many, many generations ago, like North Africa, now are among the least evangelized places on earth. And that needs to be our concern, as well as the concern of every local church in the world. It's been my joy working with a particular tribe 
in uh, the desert regions of Kenya called the Turkana over the past 20 years. I've gone there 10 or 11 times. This tribe was essentially unreached, in bondage to the false religion of witch doctors in every village. But through mission organizations like one founded by a Kenyan friend with whom I went to seminary, uh, now the whole of Turkana land is close to being reached with the gospel, with over 400 churches being planted through this mission. But here's the greatest joy. Now, the Turkana people have caught the spirit of Acts. They don't want to keep the gospel to themselves. They now proclaim that they're a missionary tribe, and they're making concrete plans to reach the Taposa people, in southern Sudan, right across the border, a people with a similar language. This is how the kingdom advances, through hearts set on fire with the love of God in Christ. Hearts that are amazed that now the holy God fully accepts us and desires to use us. Hearts that now have a passion to see others come to know and serve him as well. That is our mission brothers and sisters, to proclaim God's king. Oh God, thy kingdom come. And as we close today, let's recite the words of the Lord's Prayer together. And we'll say trespasses rather than debts. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Great to be with you guys. Thank you, Gary, for that challenge this morning to continue doing kingdom work, things that have eternal value. And looking at Paul as an example of this. At this time, your chapel group leaders will lead you in a time of prayer, and they will dismiss you at the appropriate time this morning. Hope you have a great weekend. See you next week.